Hi everyone, we're just waiting for uh, everyone to join. Um, as you probably heard when you joined, uh, the session is being recorded uh, so we can fly around um, not just the slides, but also the entire recording after the webinar for those of you who attended and also the people who signed up can attend. Um, so I hope that is okay with everyone. We'll just wait for the, all the attendees to be let in to the Zoom session. And then maybe in about a minute or so we'll get underway. Wish you all have a good Thursday morning. It stands to be this is our last session of the four WPD consultation events that we've completed in their license areas around the country. So hopefully you'll find it quite slick and well practiced. Um, and we obviously say the best till last with the East Midlands. We'll just wait for those attendees to pop in. You can see the numbers going up all the time, which is great. Probably give it 15, 20 more seconds before we get into the slides. We might have some stragglers that are still positioned at breakfast. That's absolutely fine. Uh, for those of you who have just been let into the Zoom, um, we're just waiting a few seconds. The session is being recorded so we can fire around a recording of the entire session uh, to everyone who signed up. Um, I hope that's okay. We won't have that horrible robot voice throughout just at the beginning when you join the session. Give it. 10 more seconds and then we'll get into the webinar. Awesome, let's get going. So thank you everyone uh, for joining. My name is Johnny Haynes. I work for a company called Regen and uh, we alongside Western Power Distribution are going to talk to you today about the distribution future energy scenarios in the East Midlands and specifically uh, we want to consult with you, uh, the regional stakeholders, to make sure that we are getting the right information uh, and reflecting the East Midlands specifically as a region as well. Um, a bit about Regen, if you aren't aware of who we are, we're a mission-led membership organization, a center of energy expertise and market insight. And we try and work across the energy spectrum, all the way from community energy groups up to network operators, local authorities, um, to help decarbonize, decentralize, and democratize the energy system. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, in a few minutes, I'm going to hand you over to Ollie Spink at WPD, who will go through how uh, they are strategizing their network uh, for a potential net zero future. Then myself and my colleague Grace Millman uh, will go through some of the energy story in the East Midlands. We've picked out some particularly uh, interesting aspects, especially related to the region itself. Um, and give you a chance to input into the modelling of the 2021 future energy scenarios for this East Midlands distribution network. And then we've set aside 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a question and answer session where you can grill uh, myself, Grace and Ollie around any of the information we've presented today or anything that we haven't presented and you'd like to know more about. Um, while we're on that topic, uh, you'll notice, um, I'm sure you're all Zoom veterans at this point, You'll know that in the bottom there is a Q&A function and a chat function. Please, at any point throughout the webinar, put any questions you might have into the Q&A function. That allows us to answer as many as we can um, at the end of the session, but also anything we don't get to, we will follow up in a follow-up report, which should be released in the uh, coming weeks. If you have any comments, especially around the engagement, um, or just anything you'd like to highlight, but maybe doesn't take the form of a question, please do drop it in the chat, um, especially sometimes we get some really interesting discussion between participants as well in the chat if it's a more uh, divisive topic, which is always interesting to see sometimes the best insight we can get on a certain uh, area or technology. Um, the absolute key role that you have as stakeholders is making sure that um, we are accurately reflecting the East Midlands um, and some of the regional and local considerations that occur within it. Um, this distribution future energy scenarios or DFES modeling, um, the, the whole point of it is that instead of taking sort of a national picture of what, what could happen in terms of uh, energy as we move towards an epic zero future, we want to reflect at a really granular level uh, the local and regional variation. And you guys at East Midlands, locals and natives have your ears to the ground, and we need to make sure that we are adequately reflecting that. We also augment these uh, broader webinar sessions with 
direct engagement. So some of you in the coming weeks might also get a phone call or an email from us about specific projects or uh, developments or technology. And we also uh, contact every local authority about their new developments plans for new buildings, but also their energy strategies, their climate emergencies, their clean air zones, that kind of thing. Um, the way we're going to uh, make sure we're reflecting everyone's opinion and views today is using a super slick software called Menti. So you can probably see at the top of your screen there, and now even bigger across the screen. Uh, if you could go on either your phone or your um, another tab on your internet browser or your tablet, whatever to access the internet, and go to www.menti.com, uh, you can see it on the screen there, and enter that code, so 10769675. And we'll also drop that in the chat so you can always see it. And it will also always be at the top of every slide. Um, you only need to enter it once um, and you'll be able to jump in. If you could go to uh, that website, you'll see some slides that look very similar to the ones we're seeing right now. But as we ask you a few questions throughout the webinar, uh, you'll be able to answer them and we'll be able to see the results come up live, which is always quite fun to commentate on. So. Um, we'll do a quick uh, start of the 10, which should hopefully be uh, one to get you familiar with the, the Menti software and to understand and see how it works. Um, so we just want to make sure, uh, we want to test the room. Um, were you personally aware of the WPD distribution future energy scenarios? I will be calling them DFEDs from now on to save us a lot of time. Uh, were you aware of the WPD DFEDs process before today? Uh, a simple single choice here, have you, is it yes, and you've looked at the results, are you a bit of a defense veteran, and you just want to see what we are um, talking about and updating this year? Is it yes, but you haven't looked at the results, you're sort of broadly aware of the defense process, but you haven't dug into the data, in which case uh, you should find out today a bit more about that process and also how to uh, dig into the data and what information we have produced. Or is it no, are you completely new to the defense process, in which case, um, welcome aboard, um, and hopefully today you'll get a really good rundown of what it is and why it's so important uh, for WPD's network planning. Um, and hopefully you'll be uh, able to answer this one with a yes in the future iterations. And you can see their results coming in live, it's always interesting to see. And we've got quite a broad spectrum in the room, which is always useful, it means we're engaging with new people each time, but also we've got a few uh, long-standing veterans on the call. And most people are aware of the DFEZ, but around half um, are broadly aware but haven't actually done into the results, which is absolutely fine. Um, and you can see there we're getting uh, good numbers of responses, which is great. Um, for those of you who joined us slightly late, um, you can use menti.com and the code that's at the top of the screen or in the Zoom chat um, to feed into all these uh, questions we're asking, which directly, especially later on in the webinar, when we're talking about specific technology, directly impact our modeling. Uh, for the East Midlands license area. So we'll give that a couple more seconds, people who are still going with Menti. An interesting, uh, very aesthetic looking split there. And we also want to uh, make sure that we're tailoring these events for what you also want to get out of them, as well as what we are interested in finding out from you. So this is a multiple choice. You can answer all four if you want. We just want to know what you want to get out of today's session. Um, are you interested in understanding more about the distribution of future energy scenarios process? Would you like to feed into the modeling and the assumptions behind the future energy scenario? Um, would you like to learn more about the deployment of renewables and low carbon technologies in the East Midlands? Or would you also like to hear from WPD about the distribution network in the East Midlands? We will be covering all four of these, but we've used this question from previous sessions to tailor how much attention and content we put towards each uh, part of the webinar. And uh, luckily, it looks like we're getting similar results here. A lot of people want to hear about DFEZ and about the deployment of renewables and low carbon technology. That is excellent because we have a huge number of, a uh, huge amount of analysis, some really interesting maps, graphs, and insight into uh, the East Midlands specifically. But we also have a good number of people wanting to hear and from WPD and feed into the modeling assumptions, which we also have an opportunity to do so throughout the webinar. Um, it's not so relevant for this question, um, but for later questions, we might be asking more specific questions on certain technologies um, and aspects of the future energy scenarios. Um, I can only implore you to answer as many as you can. Um, it doesn't matter if you're 
um, don't feel like you're an absolute expert in, let's say, uh, solar farm development. Uh, you are all sort of local, you're all energy engaged people. And uh, most of you are from the East Midlands area as well. So we are interested in hearing absolutely everyone's views. Please don't uh, skip a question just because you feel like you're not um, the world leading expert in that area. So I'll just give you uh, five more seconds to get your answers in on this one. And then I will be handing you over to Ollie Spink at WPD, who will be talking to you about uh, WPD's network strategy for net zero energy scenarios, how they are prepping for the future. So I will pass it over to you now, Ollie. Thank you, John T. And good morning, everyone. Just going to share my screen. So I have a few slides to present you today on the uh, distribution future energy scenarios from a WPD perspective. So what I'm uh, what I'm hopefully going to cover this morning is just a bit of a background as to why what are the distribution future energy scenarios and why uh, WPD undertake this work, um, and then go through a bit of the how we publish the data and different reports and how we use it across uh, WPD for various planning purposes. And then hopefully at the end, um, there'll be a bit of a kind of a, a definition or a explanation of how we see DFES sitting within the kind of the range of various national and local scenario forecasting publications. And hopefully there's a there's a couple of menti questions that uh, we're gonna ask after to see how well I've explained any of this. So we'll see, hopefully it goes well. So why do we, um, as a DNO, why are we interested in forecasting the future energy requirements of our customers on our network? So um, as a DNO, we're responsible for facilitating the electricity needs of our customers. And um, we're, this forecasting exercise is really for us to understand how we see the usage of the distribution network um, changing in future. and then how we can continue to accommodate the needs of our customers by um, designing, operating, and maintaining a distribution network that is able to um, maintain the level of performance that we currently do to our customers in future. And in, this is in particular, I suppose in the last four or five years or so, um, become a lot more of a integral part of WPD's strategic investment planning. And I suppose part of the reason for that is when, give, when put in the context of the, um, the UK targets of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and how the electricity network will play quite a large part in that, in potentially um, the decarbonisation of uh, transport and heat, and how some of that demand may be um, transferred onto the electricity network. We as a DNO need to um, demonstrate and I suppose give confidence to all of our customers and stakeholders that we're able to um, kind of deliver that, deliver an electricity network that's able to handle the potential range of futures that we may expect to see. So when trying to account for all of these kind of aspects, uh, traditional extrapolation from historic trends is kind of no longer really sufficient for this forecasting exercise. And there's quite a, a wide range of different technologies that we may expect to see connect to the network. And I think one thing that we have noted from the last few years is that there is quite a lot of uncertainty about the pathway that we're going to take as a country to reach these net zero targets. So we consider multiple scenarios as part of this, uh, this DFES process. And that really aims to capture, kind of, I suppose, the envelope of what we may expect to see connect to the network. So that could be a... a a future whereby there is um, a lot of the decarbonisation of heat is all um, delivered via the electricity network, or it could be conversely delivered by a kind of a low carbon gas solution such as a hydrogen. Um, and the impact that this would have in terms of how we plan our network is quite quite vastly different. So therefore, we try to in encapsulate these with a range of scenarios. In terms of the actual detail about the process, I'm not going to go into much about this in uh, my section because Regen have got some really good slides and analytics that they would like to share with you. So I'm hopefully just going to provide a bit of the context from a WPE perspective. And I suppose the point to note there at the bottom is that understanding that the 
what the UK level targets are and how the UK as a whole may meet these targets may not actually reflect what happens at a much more local level, which is what we are interested in as a DNA. So to map these scenario projections to our network, we have a obviously lots of publicly available data sets and uh, kind of analysis that Regen do. Um, they're not necessarily kind of split up into the areas that we would expect it to connect to a particular point of our distribution network. So we developed this concept called electricity supply areas. So that's basically kind of the geographic footprint as supplied by a, by a WPD primary substation. So there's in the region of, uh, I think, 1100 within our four license areas. And then we further subcategorize these by the, the local authority that each primary substation kind of uh, sits within. So that when we then we go down to this really granular level, we're able to aggregate our projections up either to a electricity supply area level, which is then really useful for electrical analysis of our networks, or we can also aggregate this to a local authority level, which is then really useful for reporting to stakeholders and something we've had really good feedback on in the past. And by going down to this really quite granular level um, and using some of the, the techniques that uh, us and Regen have developed over the years, we do see that there's quite a lot of variation from area to area, depending on things like kind of the geographic area, the um, kind of various socio and economic factors um, that then mean that it is quite useful to go down to this really, really quite granular level because it enables us to really capture it from a very local perspective rather than looking at a kind of, I suppose, a, a national level that is then just kind of divided down amongst areas. Uh, we, we find by building this up from a bottom up approach, it really enca encapsulates what we want to, um, to cover from a local area perspective. So the outputs of this DFES process, and hopefully some of you have seen uh, or have experience of using this um, screenshot we have on the on the slides of our DFES map. So this is a interactive map that's available on our website uh, for kind of interrogation of the of the data that we produce. So it's a it's a very large data set of every kind of combination of the electricity supply area technology scenario and year, uh, and it's presented on this screen here. And there's the opportunity to export data in a CSV file for kind of your manual interrogation or use. Um, and as part of this as well, we published um, bespoke local authority reports, which basically just aggregates our projections up to a local authority level, which are used by our WPD distribution managers as part of our stakeholder engagement activities. And alongside this data that we publish, um, there's also a suite of reports. And uh, so, yeah, just screenshots of these on the screen here. So the first one uh, in the top left is our stakeholder engagement summary reports. This is normally delivered in about a month or so on the back of these webinars, uh, and it outlines the questions that we've been asked and the responses we've had to our menti polls and how we plan to incorporate that into our, into our analysis for the coming year. Uh, there's also a methodology slide pack, which uh, details some of the kind of technology specific uh, techniques we use to do this forecasting. And then a technology summary report, one for each license area, which goes into quite a lot of detail about each specific technology and how we see the projections in the kind of short, medium and long term. And then for, there's a much shorter version of that called the regional review, which um, is good for, I suppose, those with not much time, but gives a really good kind of short overview of the DFES process for each license area. Um, I think we have a question in the Menti about this, but any feedback on not only the DFES map, but all of these reports, we would find really useful because, um, yeah, any any changes that we can make from year to year to better display our data or any other analytics that we can provide would be, we would yeah, be happy to listen to and try and incorporate into our suite of reports. So it's worth noting that the work that we do with Regen that we're discussing today um, provides what we call volume projections. So they are uh, projections of things that have kind of quantifiable units. They can be counted. Um, in order to actually translate this into a what, what we call a demand set that then can be used um, on a power systems model for strategic um, analysis of the distribution network, we need to assign what we call customer behavior profiles and assumptions. So this is, if you like, 
what we would expect a, for example, heat pump, a uh, customer with a heat pump, what we would expect their demand to be at any point in, uh, in time of the day or year uh, for the cardinal points that we design distribution networks to. Um, and we published a document earlier on this year called the Customer Behaviour Profiles and Assumptions Report, which um, it gives all of the expected load profiles for these technologies, trying to account for uh, kind of the diversity of multiple customers and then also how we expect these profiles to change over time. So that can be uh, wider, in, including wider scale adoption of kind of time of use tariff and pricing led de demand side response. And then also energy efficiency assumptions as well. So, uh, if you're interested, I would uh, urge you to read that document and see if uh, if it's yeah, any feedback on that will also be really appreciated. So, within uh, Western Power, I said earlier that the DFES is forming a quite integral part of how we do our um, strategic planning, and um, this flowchart aims to kind of, I suppose, demonstrate that a little bit. We have the on the left hand side all of the aspects of the DFES that we're, that we're discussing today and we undertake regen and um, the DFES is used, as I've said, for that strategic network analysis that allows us to kind of more proactively plan the development of the distribution network and the outputs of that are we publish either in regulatory reporting tables to Ofgem or as part of data exchanges with various other electricity networks as part of our uh, distribution license. And then also um, in the coming year, at least, because not all of these publications on the screen have been published yet, um, we will be publishing a suite of reports as to what the, what the network impact of our distribution future energy scenarios are and where we would need to potentially either conventionally reinforce the network or procure uh, flexibility services from customers in order to continue to operate a coordinated economic and efficient network. So hopefully that just explains about how the DFES is quite a, it, it's I suppose the first step in this strategic planning process that we do. Um, so it's very important that we're, that we're capturing not only the, the envelope of what we expect to see happen on our network, but then because it's used in such a wide array of uh, activities within WPD. One of these in particular being the um, ED2 business plan. So hot off the press, this, uh, this screenshot is the um, our ED2 business plan for the next price control period. So from 2023 to 2028 was um, published this morning, I believe. Uh, our first submission, we previously published a couple of drafts but this is our first submission, which has gone to Ofgem today. And the what's called the WPD best view scenario has been used as a basis for this uh, business planning process. And we use what we call the WPD best view scenario as a, as a single scenario that we use. So there are some reporting purposes that um, the DFES is used for where a single forecast is required rather than us presenting a range of scenarios. And for this, we've developed, um, I suppose, an additional or hybrid scenario called the WPD Best View. So that aims to, as part of that, we do a lot of stakeholder engagement with local stakeholders um, to try and build up from a bottom up approach our best guess or our best view of the pathway that we expect to see happen on the network in the next kind of five to 10 years um, that is used then as a baseline for our strategic analysis and um, Rio ED2 business planning process. But in addition to that, by also studying the other scenarios, we are able to assess the uncertainty of what would happen either above or below our best view so that then we can use um, uncertainty mechanisms and various things within the price control period to further invest in our network if required, if the growth exceeds our WPD best view um, kind of forecast. So uh, the last couple of slides, which I'd like to uh, go over are how the DFES interacts with various different scenario, national and local scenario based forecasting publications. So as some of you are aware, there will be, there are currently some, uh, a range of scenario based forecasting publications done by different electricity networks and um, other stakeholders. And I'm hopefully just trying to give some context as to where DFES sits within this. So firstly, uh, some of you may be aware of the future energy scenarios. 
which is uh, published by National Grid ESO, GV system operator. Um, and this is used as a, I suppose, as part of a, almost as a, as a base point for the DFES. And it uses what we call a common scenario framework, which has been adopted by all electricity distribution network operators within their DFES um, and the GB system operator. So we, we use a common scenario framework, which is, I suppose, the names and uh, the, the descriptions of the four scenarios. And this is because uh, Ofgem in particular, we're interested in trying to understand and benchmark different distribution network operators, strategic planning against one another and then trying to aggregate up different DFES publications by different distribution network operators to make sure that when looked at, when you aggregate these and look at it from a UK perspective, it still makes sense in terms of hitting the, um, the kind of the legally binding net zero targets that we have. So that's kind of part of the reason why we're using this common scenario framework. It drives consistency between different DNOs and it allows for aggregation and benchmarking between us. Um, as part of our Rio ED2 business planning, we've also used scenarios as published in the sixth carbon budget by the Committee for Climate Change um, as further benchmarking of our business plan. Um, so that's how a common scenario framework is used. But in terms of the differences between, I think you could probably best describe it as the, the DFES is a, a, a bottom up built view of how we expect to see the customer demand on our distribution networks change over time. And that is in specifically with the purpose of strategic planning of distribution networks. We're, we're re really interested in where that demand growth and generation growth is going to be located and connected to our network. The future energy scenarios is looking at, um, at the GB as a whole and um, focuses on the whole energy system, so electricity and gas. Um, at, and it looks through the lens of kind of how the energy system can be decarbonized from a balancing of supply and demand perspective. But it's it's relatively agnostic as to where the exact location of that generation and demand growth is going to be um, kind of connected to the electricity network. So it's got a slightly different focus um, to what the DFES is. And as a result, I suppose, <laughs> as a result of anything where you have a top down approach and a bottom up approach, they don't necessarily meet in the middle. So there is a small amount of variance between DFES and FES, but that's because of the slightly different purposes and focuses that they're used for. So then finally, how does DFES interact with local area energy planning? So this is um, quite a hot topic, I suppose, recently between um, ourselves and various local stakeholders. So whilst the DFES uses um, information from local authorities and combined authorities and so on as an as a input data source for our DFES, we hope to capture the, the range of ambition and um, growth that we expect to see um, delivered at a lo local level but there are, there will be some instances where the common scenario framework that we work to as a DNO may be um, not aligned with the local targets that are set by a particular local authority or regional authority where whereby a local area energy plan may look at a, an accelerated pathway so let's say meeting net zero at a much earlier date and as part of that there would be scope for what's called a local area energy plan which kind of sits slightly um, outside the realm of the the DFES um, kind of envelope of what we expect to see um, so it's, I think it's, it's worth noting here that they there are they're not trying to do necessarily the same thing because I think a local area energy plan would be generally looking at a much more granular area and potentially looking at kind of a postcode level and is is designed to look at a pathway to reach regional targets um, without necessarily assessing in particular where that, how that is going to affect the electricity network in terms of a kind of power system analysis. So I think I suppose to try and summarize it uh, shortly, the difference between the FES and the DFES and the kind of bottom up approach and a top down approach could be mirrored in the sense from a DFES and a local area energy plan perspective. But I think we see where the local area uh, targets and pathways sit within the range of what we what we uh, what we are forecasting as part of DFES, we see 
the DFES data sets and processes being a really key input that could be used to drive that local area energy plan. And where a local area energy plan is looking at a pathway that is outside the kind of the envelope of what we're planning to as a DNO, then that is a, I suppose, a slightly separate discussion that we need to have as to why that is the case and then how that can be fed back into the national picture and then fed back into our DFES so we can best in encapsulate how local ambition will be delivered at a, to the network at a local level. So I think that's that's about my time allocation up. So hopefully that's been that's been useful and just set a bit of context as to how um, Western Power uses the DFES. And uh, I believe we now have a couple of questions that uh, Regen are going to ask on this via a mentee. So I will pass back over to uh, John T. Brilliant, thanks Ali. We've got our questions back on the screen there. Yeah, as Ali says, um, we just want to make sure um, there are a couple of questions around explicitly the, the DFES, uh, the WPD aspect of DFES. Um, so fingers on buzzers again, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, meat of the the East Midlands renewables, low carbon technologies uh, questions and information. So could you just say uh, simply, um, how do you feel uh, your level of engagement is with WPD? Do you feel like you are um, well engaged, um, happy with the level of engagement that you are receiving? Do you feel like maybe you're slightly under engaged and you appreciate more uh, webinar sessions such as these or uh, more uh, bespoke sessions? Um, depending on who you are in the industry, or do you actually feel over-engaged? I know uh, some people are feeling like there's a lot of webinars going around at the moment, um, and maybe you feel like actually there's a bit of a death by webinar going on. Um, I can see the results coming in now. For those of you who joined us late, uh, as uh, Hannah said in the chat, um, we're using a site called Menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com. You can see it at the top of your screen. And if you enter that, um, eight digit code 10769675, you'll be able to answer these uh, polls absolutely live. And I'm also very pleased to see that people are starting to use the chat and the question answer function. That's absolutely great. We will be able to get to those questions at the end of the Q&A session um, as well. So that is perfect. And I'm glad to see the results coming in. It's good to see um, a mixture of a lot of people feeling that they're well engaged, but also a decent portion who feel under-engaged, obviously we can take that away and make sure that we are getting as many people as possible on the well-engaged uh, slice of that pie chart. So we'll give you a couple more seconds to answer that. So see some results still coming in. Brilliant. Um, so Ollie spent a bit of time there uh, talking about the relationship between National Grid FES WPD DFES, and then the local area energy planning, where we try and reflect um, really specifically local area energy plans and ambitions. Um, we understand that that is quite a convoluted, uh, slightly difficult relationship, um, and it would be um, great to just get a sort of check in um, on how well you feel like you understand it, all the way down from at the bottom, whether you don't understand it at all and you're not quite sure what those words on the screen are and all the way up to uh, you understand it very well. And I guess a 10 out of 10 would be, if I could put you on uh, on video now, you could explain to everyone on the call. Uh, I'm not gonna do that, but if, if you know, that's, what, that's what a 10 out of 10 would be, you feel like you'd be very comfortable explaining the relationship between those three uh, types of network and local area energy planning. So it's always interesting to see the range of this. As we saw at the beginning, we have a range of people on the call who are, who are fresh to DFEZ all the way to DFES veterans, so we are also expecting a range here. Um, but it's good to see that it looks like um, the majority of people are finding themselves sort of, they understand it quite well, uh, maybe not the absolute intricacies of it, um, but the general level of understanding is really good to see. Excellent. Um, now we had a comment in the chat earlier, um, which is great, um, which is about um, how, wh whether the stakeholders are actually using the DFES data and engaging with the DFES data. Um, so part of that is making sure that the whatever we're publishing um, is actually uh, useful and there isn't something that we're missing uh, or other people would find useful in addition. So this is a free form answer. Just if you have something that came to mind while you were speaking and going through the results there, 
um, whack it in the, uh, the mentee answers, and we will uh, see if we can um, produce something similar. So as Ollie went through, we, we, there is the DFES data set online um, as part of an online interactive map that's cut by local authority and also cut by those electricity supply areas. We also produce sort of supporting documents around the methodology and summary regional review, regional view reports um, and technology by technology summaries by license area. Um, and feel free to be completely selfish here. Um, if it's something that you would find useful, but you think only you would find useful, absolutely still put it down. You know, if we've got um, a parliamentarian on the call who wants it split by constituency, put that down. Uh, we might not get down to, <laughs> we might not go down to that, but it's always useful to know what people would find useful in addition to the current outputs. Excellent. I understand that a lot of people will not have an additional thing to add on this one, so I won't uh, be pushing uh, for 25 unique responses, but anything you do have that comes to mind, um, back it down. I'll give you sort of uh, 10 more seconds on that one, because I know it's a, it's a free form. And then we'll get into um, some of the East Midlands license area context and analysis. Thank you everyone who's putting in chat, uh, comments in the Q&A, that's really good, and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Uh, looking like some really good and well engaged questions as well, which is good to see. If you do have any thoughts about this question in particular, do just put them in the chat, you can message the panellists only or you can message everyone, um, and then we'll be able to uh, get to it. So, uh, now myself and my colleague Grace Millman will go through some of the technologies that we've uh, picked out as particularly interesting in the East Midlands. Um, in terms of, we will get asked this question, so I thought I'd uh, preempt it. The scope of the distribution future energy scenario is pretty much anything that will connect to the distribution network. And that's not a particularly obvious distinction. Um, anything that's really, really big in size, so like nuclear power stations, big offshore wind installations, massive gas fire power stations and coal fire power stations. Uh, that will be on the transmission network, you know, hundreds or, of megawatts or gigawatts in scale. The distribution network is, is everything else below that. Uh, so it's typically in the tens of megawatts, so there are some bigger installations, um, all the way down to sort of domestic and commercial level. So that's um, covering everything, onshore and offshore wind, ground-mounted solar, you know, landfill gas, still smaller scale gas peaking plants, uh, battery storage. Then on the demand side, electrified heat, whether that's through a heat pump or a night storage heater, um, electric vehicles and their associated chargers, housing and business space development, new sort of big sources of potential de electricity demand, and um, in the future, possibly uh, things like hydrogen electrolyzers. So I'm going to um, discuss uh, re the renewable generation story in the East Midlands, and I'm going to start with this uh, very cluttered map, and I will declutter it in a second. Um, but this map is going to come out up throughout the uh, webinar in various forms. It's essentially every installation that's above a megawatt in size. So we haven't got every rooftop solar array on there, uh, but every larger scale solar PV array, uh, wind farm, bioenergy installation, whether that's landfill gas or anaerobic digestion or sewage gas. And there is a single lonely hydro site uh, in the Peak District. Um, and the crux of these maps is that anything in blue uh, is a site that is currently connected and exporting electricity to the WPD distribution network. And anything in green is what we call a pipeline site, which is a site that has um, agreed a connection with WPD, um, but they haven't actually got to the stage of actually exporting electricity. They could be anywhere from the very early stage of the development. They've got that um, connection, uh, but they haven't even maybe started entering the planning system or getting financed. Or well, they could be all the way through to they've got full planning permission. They're maybe even putting space in the ground now and starting to uh, construct their project. Um, so these pipeline sites are a great indication of where the um, East Midlands renewable generation might go over the sort of next five, six, seven years. So if I, um, you can see on there, there's a huge amount of squares representing solar PV. If I just quickly remove them for a second, and we'll get back to them in a minute, um, you can see that in terms of the other renewable generation. Um, there's quite a lot of onshore wind, especially in the south and the uh, east of the license area, uh, which totals almost 400, uh, over 400 megawatts. Sorry. Um, but because of the uh, less 
favourable planning regime in England, especially for onshore wind over the last few years. There are only two pipeline projects, albeit one of them is uh, quite significant in size. There's also a couple of offshore wind farms from the round one of the um, offshore wind CFD, uh, which uh, on shore um, up in the uh, northeast of the license area there, which total 200 megawatts of capacity. Um, and a large number of rather smaller scale bioenergy sites, most of which are landfill gas, um, but also a decent number of biomass and anaerobic digestion sites, um, which typically you can see, especially landfill gas, is normally situated around areas of population. So you've got, you know, Derby, Nottingham, Leicester, uh, the southern tip is Sheffield, and in the south, uh, places like Northampton. Um, you can see that kind of western half of the license area has a lot of population, and that is a continuing theme going forward, that kind of populated western half and the less populated, more rural eastern half of the license area. If I switch now to uh, the distribution connected ground mounted solar, you can see that there is a huge number of especially large scale pipeline projects represented by those green squares. In fact, I believe it's over three gigawatts of potential um, solar PV capacity compared to um, a gigawatt that currently exists in my network, mainly in the form of slightly smaller scales or between up to 20 megawatt projects, which were uh, supported by the feed in tariff um, in the uh, middle of last decade. Um, some of those sites are absolutely huge. There's one I've picked out a couple, uh, one in the north that's potentially a 90 megawatt site and one in the south near Banbury, which is potentially a 130 megawatt site. So looking at amazing installations of excellent low carbon and renewable electricity. If I put that on a graph uh, to make it clear, um, you can see there, you can see that development, uh, the blue line being um, between 2012 and 2016 or so, uh, plenty of um, baseline sites supported by the feeding tariff, uh, but that's almost entirely dwarfed by the potential pipeline of sites, much bigger sites, um, which, as I said before, totals well over three gigawatts in capacity. Um, which is sort of is contrasting to four or five years of very little uh, growth in large scale solar PV capacity. So clearly, there's a lot of appetite uh, for a lot of solar PV to start deploying on the network in the next few years. But there's a question there between, you know, we've had so much, a bit of stagnation. When will that actually start connecting and start exporting to the network? Um, so we have a menti question for you here. Uh, when do you think that the large scale solar pipeline will start connecting in the East Midlands? Do you think it will start connecting fairly imminently? You might, uh, in your various discussions and your various roles in energy, uh, have some kind of in inclination towards uh, the start of the decade? Or do you think it'll actually take a bit longer? Like a lot of these sites are, maybe you think they're a bit speculative, they're getting that connection agreement, but they're not actually. Uh, looking to build out uh, until a lot later in the decade. Just to re-emphasize here, um, everyone's responses are really useful and really valid for our analysis. You don't have to be the world leading expert in ground mounted solar development to answer this question. And we're always really interested to see uh, what kind of range ends up being developed as well. Um, as you can see here, we're getting answers across the spectrum all the way from um, next year, all the way up to the late 2020s. And that's the beauty of these um, future energy scenarios that we have. We don't have, we're not looking at a single forecast where we have to find the answer, but we want to make sure we're representing a reasonable range of answers, a reasonable envelope of potential outcomes. You can see there, um, kind of a bit of a bimodal distribution. Some people think they might be developed sort of in 2023, 2024 time, and a few more people thinking it might be a bit later, and there might be uh, developers waiting a bit longer for solar prices to come down and for the business case to fully develop. To be a bit later in the decade. I'll give you uh, just a few more seconds on that one. I think everyone's answered very quickly, which is really good to see. Obviously, uh, very savvy with the mentee, which is always useful for these kinds of webinars. And let's just uh, have a bit more information, discuss, it, discuss a bit more around the maps and the graph that we're also presenting as well. Excellent. So, um, we know the pipeline issues in the East Midlands, and we've seen similar in the West Midlands. And I know that UKPN just yesterday um, released a bit of a statement saying that they're seeing absolute huge numbers of pipeline sites 
um, in their eastern network as well. Um, the East Midlands, I think, is even ahead of all of those. I mean, we've seen South Wales and South, seen the West Midlands, but the East Midlands, in terms of raw capacity, is absolutely far and away the um, greatest size for solar PV. And we just want to test check uh, why that might be. Uh, obviously, all of you are East Midlands, or a lot of you are from the East Midlands, so you may have a specific regional consideration around why it's so attractive for solar PV developers uh, to try and secure site. So uh, this is a Menti ranking question. So you can essentially rank these from most important or most impactful to least impactful. We want to know of these um, four attributes, why is the East Midlands solar pipeline so even bigger than the already very large pipeline in the surrounding regions? Is it the cost of land? Is it that it's maybe slightly easier for developers to acquire uh, good land for solar development, um, maybe not competing so much with really high grade agricultural land, or there's a lot of land fairly proximal to a network. Is it an easier network connection? Are developers finding uh, connections uh, either cheaper or there is more capacity on the network uh, that can be exploited? Is it a potentially an untapped market? We've seen uh, in the early years of the feed and tariff, we saw all, a lot of um, so development focused on the very south of the country with slightly higher levels of irradiance is that the East Midlands is seen as an untapped market for new solar development as prices have um, come down considerably and people are looking to develop without the support of a subsidy. Or is it the proximity to demand? The East Midlands has um, that um, chunk uh, in the western half of the license area along the M1 where um, Nottingham, Derby, Sheffield, even Coventry comes into the East Midlands license area, WPD. Is it that uh, being possible to demand makes it easier to develop um, low carbon generation on the distribution network? See the answers coming in there. And it's always interesting to see which ones come out the top, which comes out the bottom. Interesting that um, the cost of land and the proximity to demand are coming up quite high, uh, while there's well, the untapped market angle is not so uh, popular. Um, as usual, if you think there's something else that we might have, uh, you want to highlight or you think we might have overlooked, please do put it in the chat um, and we will be able to consider that going forward as well. And thank you for everyone putting in the question for the question and answer session as well. I'll give you um, 10 more seconds on that one. I know it's ranking questions are slightly more than the multiple choice, so it takes a bit longer. Um, but that's really, really useful uh, for the analysis and to make sure that we understand uh, the situation in the East Midlands specifically, especially when we're talking about gigawatts and gigawatts of potential solar in the next few years. Excellent. Um, I am now about to hand you over to my colleague, Grace Milman, who is going to talk to you about all kinds of technologies, but I believe we're starting with bioenergy. So uh, take it away, Grace. Perfect. Thank you, John T. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the call today. My name is Grace Millman and I'm an energy analyst at Regen. Um, and I am working with John T on this year's DFES for Western Power Distribution. Um, just to reiterate some of the things that John T has said, it's really important that you log on to Menti and continue to answer these polls. Um, they provide valuable insight to our analysis and um, they allow us to um, uh, evidence our scenarios and to um, basically come down on a decision for the East Midlands, which is uh, really valuable. And also to put um, any questions you have in the Q&A function of Zoom. Again, we will be having a Q&A panel discussion at the end of this call. So um, any questions in there, we will try to answer. And any that we don't get to answer in the session, we will um, answer in a follow up report that will be published after the event. Perfect. So talking about bioenergy now, um, bioenergy can play an important role in meeting the UK's long term emissions target and has been talked about by organisations such as the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, sustainable bioenergy can be a low carbon alternative to fossil fuels, which we currently use today um, in many applications, including um, some of the ones I've got on the screen here. So industrial and residential heat. It can be used in the production of hydrogen, which we will be talking about later on today. Um, it can be used as a transport fuel for shipping, aviation and road transport. 
It can be used um, combined with carbon capture and storage. And um, particularly for the DFES, it can also be used as a source of electricity generation. So thinking about that in particular, um, we've got a mentee question here, which is what will be the long term role of distribution scale bioenergy electricity generation in particular? Um, so in the East Midlands license area, it would be great to get any thoughts you've got on this. We've got a few different scenarios here, um, which I'll just quickly run through. So will it play a limited or reduced role with bioenergy prioritised for higher value uses, as some of the ones we've just talked about, maybe for hydrogen, maybe for aviation and shipping? Um, will it have a similar role to today with on-site generation at farms, sewage plants and waste centres? Or will it be expanded as a form of low carbon dispatchable flexible generation? Uh, flexible generation is obviously something we need a lot more of um, looking towards a net zero future. So will it have a role to play here and actually see um, an expansion? Thank you for all your responses so far. I see we've got about 13. So uh, try and get up, that up into the mid 20s. That would be amazing. Interesting to see here we've got a uh, range of different responses. As Jonty said earlier, it's always good to get a range of different responses. It shows that we're engaging with the right people. We're getting a spread of opinions. Um, and as mentioned, we use the National Grid FES scenarios in our work um, and they detail four different scenarios. So we don't come down on uh, one uh, view of the future. We have four different scenarios. So um, evidence like this is great for our analysis. Great, I'll leave that open for a few more seconds here. Um, quite a shift towards maybe an expansion of our bioenergy um, for electricity generation. As I said, flexible generation will be uh, very important in the future. And not many people thinking that it, you know, it will be diverted maybe to other value, higher value uses. So uh, great feedback there. Thank you for all your responses. I'm going to be moving on now um, as I've just talked about flexible generation, flexibility and storage is an increasing part of the energy system um, and of our analysis, um, but it could also be the key to unlocking more renewables connection to the grid. So it really does play a vital role in us achieving net zero emissions. Looking at the map here, um, we've got again quite a lot going on um, similar to our uh, renewable generation map earlier. You can see that there's a transition happening. So the blue sites are the baseline operational sites, uh, while the green icons represent a project in planning or under construction um, that could connect in the future. And what we can see is that there's a transition happening from fossil fuel flexibility, so mainly gas, which are the, the circles on the map, uh, with some diesel in there as well. And the transition is moving to clean storage, which is all the squares. Um, as a means of flexibility and grid balancing of services. Much of the pipeline is storage, as I've just said, with a few fossil gas sites um, here and there. Um, and we can see that a lot of the future storage sites are of significant capacity, so around 50 megawatts. So um, looking at some of the current operational ones, we've got some big scale sites in the East Midlands, for example, a 350 megawatt power station at Corby, um, which connects to WPED's network um, and as well as the Derwent power station. So some really high megawatts, high capacity uh, gas stations currently operational. Um, looking at those in particular, so this is gas fired flexible generation. We can see a lot of existing generation. Um, as I've just mentioned, lots of these large scale um, sites over 50 megawatts, maybe into the 100 megawatts, as well as a few potential future projects. And um, these tend to be around 5 to 20 megawatts, as you can see some of the smaller green circles. But um, also there's a large 60 megawatt site near Lincoln that is uh, potentially going to connect. For fossil gas uh, generation, what we're going to look at now is gas reciprocating engines. So these are specifically used for peaking power generation. And what you can see from the graph here is there's been an increase in connected capacity since 2015, all the way up to now 462 megawatts across 43 sites in the East Midlands. Um, and then the green bars down at the bottom show the sites that have been um, accepted to connect, but haven't yet connected. So these are potential future projects. And we can see that there's been 14 sites accepted to connect between 2017 and 2020, but these are not yet operational. And they total 143 megawatts 
uh, with the average size of sites being around 10 megawatts, which is fairly consistent to what we're seeing at the moment. Although obviously, as I've said, there are some large sites in there as well. So thinking about the coming decade um, and flexible gas fire generation in particular, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on what you think might be the future of flexible gas fire generation. As Jonty said earlier, um, we realise that not everyone is going to be an expert on every single thing, but it's still super important to respond with your thoughts and your opinions, because that's what these sessions are about. Um, so again, we've got a few different options here. So limited development, um, so gas, flexible gas fire generations, there's not really anything else connecting. The sites that are there remain operational and maybe um, switch over to different technologies in the future or something like that. And that would be due to the national and regional net zero targets that have been set. Um, another option is they continue to develop. So those pipeline sites connect and uh, we get another 150 megawatts uh, connected in WPD's license area or um, the development increases. And again, it's to provide flexible dispatchable generation, which would be critical to net zero. Um, as we saw before, there are lots of different forms of flexible dispatchable generation. So uh, gas fire generation is not the only option, but we have got um, the potential for it to continue for the pipeline to increase more projects to apply for um, connections and things like that. So I think what, what we can see so far is actually a big shift towards the limited development and um, obviously unabated uh, fossil gas we want to reduce in order to meet net zero emissions. Um, so I think with the national and regional targets, it's clear that, that could be a very um, popular option. Obviously, it's more difficult in um, actuality. Um, so that's where we look at the different scenarios of different um, ways that these might uh, decommission or change over to different technologies. Perfect. Thanks for all your responses and thanks for the questions and comments coming in. Um, as I mentioned before, if you do have a question, please try and put it in the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, this way we will be able to answer them and uh, move them around as we do answer them. Um, if you've got any clarifications that you need or comments, um, please do put it in the chat function. Perfect. So moving on now, um, we're going to move on to electricity storage. So we can see here that there is a significant amount of proposed storage projects in the pipeline in East Midlands, but also a few sites already connected and operational. And these sites will already be providing grid services in the area. We can see from the map that most of the current storage projects, so again, the blue squares, um, are approximately 5 to 20 megawatts, while a lot of future projects are closer to 50 megawatts. So there is a big um, jump here in what we're seeing in storage. It is very popular with the developers. Um, a lot of them are being located um, close to existing or new renewable generation. Um, and we can see this in the pipeline here. As I just mentioned, there's uh, different ways that batteries and um, electricity storage can connect. And we call these business models. Um, so storage can provide flexibility at a range of scales. Um, so looking at the multi megawatt scale, so as I just mentioned about some of the 50 megawatt connections, um, we'd be looking at standalone network services. So um, large scale batteries providing balancing flexibility and support services to the grid as their so, um, like whole source of revenue. Um, and also at this scale, we'd be seeing co-location. So where a battery is installed alongside an existing or proposed renewable energy generation project, um, and it can help the generators to optimize their assets. Then on a smaller scale, so we're going down to single megawatts, we've got a high energy user. So um, these are sited at large energy user operational sites, and they can support on-site energy management. And then going all the way down to the domestic scale, we have the 10 to 20 kilowatt scale. Uh, batteries and these are installed in households alongside rooftop PV and um, or other renewable generation to provide backup services. And thinking about the future and what the future of electricity storage might look like, um, I'd like you now to rank those business models. So um, again, as we mentioned before, you might have to just hover over the options to see them. Um, but we have here the four I've just mentioned, so standalone and co-location being the multi-megawatt large-scale batteries, high energy user being single megawatts, and domestic being a few kilowatts um, installed in houses. 
I'm not sure if we're seeing those answers yet. So there we go. Perfect. So we've got high energy user and co-location up there at the moment, but it's all changing as more people answer. And as I mentioned um, in the pipeline, we are seeing a lot of co-location already. So developers are looking to co-locate batteries when they're putting in an application for a new solar farm or wind farm. Um, and it is interesting for us to look into the possibility that this becomes what we'd refer to as business as usual. So um, whenever a developer is looking to connect a solar farm, they would automatically put in an application for a battery as well. Um, so co-location is definitely one we're seeing um, already in practice as well as um, the high energy user being a more accessible form, being maybe a single megawatt battery rather than 50 megawatts. So as you can imagine, um, the scale of those and the costing of those is completely different. So thanks for all your responses there. I think we've hit the magic 25, which is great. Um, means I can happily say we've got the data. Great, I'll leave that open for 10 more seconds in case anyone else wants to put their opinions in. And it's actually interesting um, in other uh, webinars that we've run, co-location is far and away the winner. So it's great to see that there's a bit of difference between the license areas and maybe in where we think this will um, have growth over the near and medium term. Perfect, cool. I can see some questions coming in as well, so that's great. Moving on now to hydrogen. So, um, the future of hydrogen in the East Midlands is actually already gaining traction. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not be familiar with hydrogen, um, but uh, the University of Nottingham announced a few weeks ago that they were wanting to set up an East Midlands hydrogen innovation zone, um, which could be amazing for attracting investment and getting some projects on the ground um, involving hydrogen. Specifically, we're looking at green hydrogen today because obviously we are doing um, we're working with WPD on electricity future scenarios and um, electrolysis, which produces green hydrogen, would be connected to the distribution or transmission network. And hydrogen is increasingly being considered as part of a net zero future. It's being flagged as a potential fuel for what we would refer to as difficult to decarbonise areas. Um, and these include some of the ones on the screen here. So for example, a, an easy low hanging fruit would be to decarbonize existing hydrogen production. The UK currently produces about 27 terawatt hours of hydrogen a year, but it's um, high emission, it's um, high carbon. And so decarbonizing this through green hydrogen could be an easy option. It's also being um, touted as a fuel for firing high temperature industrial processes. Um, as a transport fuel for HGVs and buses, for example, hydrogen buses are being talked about for Derby. Um, it can also be used in aviation and shipping, potentially in the form of ammonia. And I know that the East Midlands Airport are looking into the potential of integrating hydrogen into their operation. It can also be used as a form of electricity generation and is also being talked about for the heating of some homes and businesses. Um, as I said, we're only focused on green hydrogen today, as this would connect to the electricity network. Similar to battery storage, hydrogen um, could have a few different business models which it operates under. Um, so I'd be interested to know your views on which of these business models will see the most growth over the near and medium term. I will just talk through some of these quickly, as you might not be familiar with them. So we've got co-location again, so co-location with renewable generation. For example, um, at Featherstone House Farm in Nottingham, there's currently um, a co-location of electrolyzer with a um, with renewable generation. Um, so would this see a growth like we're seeing in storage? There's small scale electrolyzers at transport hubs, so mainly looking at refueling um, buses and vehicles and fleets and things like that. Medium scale electrolyzers uh, located in industrial clusters. Um, so maybe the uh, decarbonisation of steel and cement industries and things like that. L large scale electrolyzers used for exporting hydrogen. So actually just focus on a large scale production of hydrogen, which will then be exported to other countries as um, hydrogen trade starts to um, grow. 
or a fusion hire which prioritizes cheaper imports rather than domestic production. So looking at the imports of hydrogen rather than producing it in our own areas. So uh, I can see there that we've got not so much uh, support for the export or import. Obviously, hydrogen um, is fairly um, nascent in its um, sector. So obviously, we're not at the scale yet for exports and imports. Um, and with the near medium term caveat on this question, it's great to see that we've got support for the small scale and medium scale electrolyzers and also the co-location with renewable generation. Thank you for all your answers so far. As I said, they're really valuable for us. Um, with hydrogen in particular, the National Grid FES has only been using it in its models for the last few years. Um, so there are still a lot of assumptions and um, things we need to clarify. And it's great to see that on a regional scale, there are differences in opinions around it and the role that it will have. Um, so obviously, as Jen was saying earlier, with some of the bigger cities, um, with Nottingham and Derby and things like that, then we could see that transport is a key driver, as well as the M1, obviously, going through the license area. Great, thanks for all your input. So I'm going to leave it open for 30 more seconds, try and get a few more people. Um, as I said before, if you don't know anything about hydrogen, still please try and answer the question, maybe using your geographical knowledge um, or, you know, obviously, region specific knowledge um, please do answer the questions it does help us a lot perfect thank you great okay jokes so um Moving on now, I think it is back to my colleague Jonti to uh, discuss domestic heat. Thank you all so much for your time. Perfect, thank you, Grace. Uh, yes, I'm gonna take it down a step in terms of scale now. We're gonna talk a bit about electrified domestic heat, and then we're also gonna talk a bit about electric vehicles. Um, thank you all for your questions in the chat, and you'll also notice that um, Ollie's colleague, Ben Godsby, who is DSO manager at WPD, is also answering some of them live as well. Um, but we'll also get to the rest in the Q&A session. So electrified domestic heat, obviously currently a very interesting topic. Heat's one of the hardest areas to decarbonize. Currently, around 90% of the country is either on gas or some other kind of fossil fuel, like oil or LPG. Um, the government has an ambition to uh, for the UK to install 600,000 heat pumps per year by 2028, which will be ramping up current uh, rates of installation by over 20 times. And going hand in hand with this is an ambition to phase out high carbon fossil fuel heating in off gas properties, so oil, LPG, coal, that kind of thing, in the next decade. And the future home standard, which you'll definitely have seen in the news, it's the uh, ban on new gas boilers in new homes, uh, which is expected to come into force from 2025. Um, some of this will be made a lot more clear, hopefully, in the upcoming heated building strategy, which they uh, say will come out in uh, fairly imminently. In terms of the East Midlands license area specifically then, um, what we see uh, based on this sort of heat map where more blue means more heat pumps is um, a really clear on off gas split. Lots of the, um, the western half of the license area is very heavily on gas and in areas where there is gas available for home heating, it's generally not uh, very little else uh, that is used. Gas boiler is you know, the de facto uh, heating technology. However, we have seen a reasonable amount of heat pump uptake in off gas areas, especially in the more rural areas uh, where homes are typically heated by a wet system uh, using oil, uh, LPG, uh, solid fuel, that kind of thing. Um, but we're still, only, even in the, in the areas of the most development, we're still only talking about sort of one in 20 homes having a heat pump. And uh, so if the government is to hit that 600,000 uh, per year target across the GB, we would have to see this uh, this change not only in uh, off gas rural areas but also across um, possibly across on gas areas as well. The question we have for you here, uh, which is a slightly more complex question, is um, as the government looks to achieve this target, six hundred thousand heat pumps installed per year by twenty twenty eight, which of these areas do you think will be targeted most and the least? 
So each of these potential sort of types of housing have a slider, and you can tell us whether you think it's very unlikely they'll be targeted for a heat pump over the next uh, seven or eight years, or whether you think they would be prime candidates uh, for heat pump deployment. So the options there, um, off-gas fossil fuels, such as oil, LPG, and coal houses, um, all off-gas houses, so including um, houses currently heated by direct electric heating or night storage heating, on-gas houses, whether the government might look to tackle, you know, 85% of the country is using an on-gas fossil gas boiler, will they uh, try and target them from the very beginning, uh, there's a lot of houses, uh, 20 million houses or more to tackle. Um, will it be social housing? Will it be leveraging um, social landlords and their ability to potentially uh, engender change over large portions of the housing market? Will it be new build housing as we've seen with the future, uh, future home standard? Uh, will that be uh, heavily targeting heat pump deployment? Or will it be households in fuel poverty? We, uh, we know that fuel poverty um, correlates very strongly with more expensive fuels like LPG uh, and solid fuel. Uh, will they be targeted through support schemes and measures uh, to install a much more efficient and cheaper to run heat pump alongside the rollout of energy efficiency measures? Uh, this is always one of my favourite slides just because the results always look really interesting and there's always something to comment on. Um, so I'll give you a bit of time. Uh, I appreciate this is six individual sliders, so a slightly longer question, but already seeing some really interesting results coming in. And this helps us uh, directly uh, guide where um, new heat pumps over the next few years might be situated on WCD's network. We can break it down house by house and use uh, that alongside some of the information coming out from government around where heat pumps may end up being deployed. Awesome, good to see. A lot, a lot of results uh, in previous events, a lot of these results have been a lot more uh, binary and they've either been all the way to very unlikely, all the way to very, very likely. So it's always interesting to see the difference between different regions. Um, but a couple, of, a couple of front runners coming up there in the off-gas fossil fuel and the new build housing category. Um, but quite a few people also thinking that we'll target everything, including on-gas houses as well, uh, which I could definitely see happening um, from my point of view. Um, fundamentally, we can't, just tackle 15% of housing stock uh, when we have to have no unabated fossil fuel generation by 2050. So I'll give you a couple more seconds just to finish answering that one. You've got a couple of sliders left to go. See a comment in the chat there that the heating building strategy has been delayed again uh, to October. I can't confirm or deny this, but I would not be surprised at all. I think I probably did this webinar uh, for a similar webinar last year. I think I also used the word in a few months. So I am also very disappointed, Tim, I agree. Um, okay, so moving on to electric vehicles now, sort of the other side of the domestic scale uh, new demand technology. A bit of a, a briefing then, um, you'll definitely have seen in the news that the UK government is looking to ban the sale of new petrol diesel or internal combustion engine cars and vans from 2030 and their plug-in hybrid equivalents from 2035. Um, Right now, we've seen uh, EV sales increase dramatically at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that is in terms of both um, as a proportion of total car sales, but also in absolute terms. Um, and this is also comes hand in hand with an increase, uh, ever increasing charging infrastructure um, in sort of new developments and also on the uh, motorway network, especially with the, uh, the M1 running through the license area. In terms of um, the East Midlands itself then, what we've seen in the past is that the East Midlands has consistently been ahead of uh, GB in terms of how, what proportion of cars and vans are electrified by about 20%. So in 2020, just over 1.3% of cars and LGBs in the East Midlands were electric compared to 1.1% in GB. And we've also seen uh, the East Midlands far ahead of the other WCD license areas in terms of EV charging capacity. Uh, which um, I can't personally right now tell you the exact reason for this. Uh, but it's really interesting, you know, doubling is almost as much as the other three license areas combined. And it's split across a wide array of charging types. So it's not just um, a single, you know, there's an EV charger in every car park, but also at destinations like shopping centers, supermarkets. I think IKEA have a load of EV chargers. There's also a decent number of workplace chargers, um, a really high number compared to everyone else of on-street EV chargers. 
and also on route EV charges, which is the term we give to um, similar to the petrol station model, where it will be a long major uh, road network for you pop in to charge your EV and then continue your journey. What we want to check in on then, given this uh, very, very different picture in the East Midlands, is why you might think the East Midlands current uptake of EVs and EV charges would be ahead of the national rate. Um, could it be that um, in some areas there are high levels of affluence and therefore the, um, the current capital cost of EVs being slightly higher is less impactful? Um, could it be that there are more multi-car households and that allows people to you know, have an EV for most of their trips, but also have the sort of backup of a ICE vehicle so they don't suffer from um, supposed range anxiety? Uh, could it be that there are much higher levels of off-street parking, which allows people to... Um, have a domestic home charger installed? Could it be uh, what we saw on the previous slide, that there's a lot more charging infrastructure and therefore it gives people confidence that if they do get an EV, they'll be able to top up and charge uh, all across the East Midlands? Is there, uh, for some reason or another, a greater, aware greater awareness of electric vehicles and the benefits they can have? Um, or is it actually not uh, people, but company fleets uh, converting to electric vehicles en masse and that's driving the uptake of EVs? So I believe this is uh, a multiple choice. So you can choose uh, all six if you think they're all relevant, or you can pick pick your favourite. Um, I can see everyone answering really quickly, which is really good. It gives us a bit more time for the Q and A at the end as well, um, and some interesting questions in the chat, which I will have to field in a second. Excellent. I'll give you uh, five more seconds of that. Everyone answers that pretty quickly. We'll just get to the itching to get to the Q and A. So finally, um, just to highlight, especially as we have a lot of local authorities on the call with us today, uh, we do do a, something called a new development study where we contact every single local authority in the area and make sure we're accurately reflecting their new housing and business land allocations in their planning, um, but also uh, finding out about heat strategy, transport strategy, climate modes and declarations and stuff that would impact uh, the uptake of certain technologies on a local authority scale. Um, climate emergencies, particularly over the last year, year and a half, have been really uh, popular. And what we want to know from you is what impact those climate emergencies, especially those local climate emergency declarations, might have over the coming decade or so. Um, so a few options here, and put in the chat if you think there are other things that we have missed. Um, could it be zoning for low carbon heat options, such as uh, heat networks, heat pumps, hydrogen areas, that kind of thing. Will it be result in an increase in EV charging infrastructure, especially public EV charging infrastructure driven by the local government? Could it result in electrification of public transport, such as buses, uh, from uh, less low carbon options? Could it be designation of zones for renewable energy? Um, so uh, areas where uh, wind and solar installations, for example, might have a more favorable planning regime. On the other end of the spectrum, could it be refusal of planning permission for projects incompatible with net zero? So a new planning application for a gas peaking plant, for example, is that compatible in a local authority that has declared a climate emergency and is looking to achieve net zero by 2050 or before 2050? And could it also result in increased standards for housing developments such as zero carbon homes, EV chargers, uh, required rooftop solar, that kind of thing? And some awesome results coming in here. I always love this dot, these dots coming in, uh, and everyone's answering really quickly, which is also amazing to see. I will give you uh, maybe 10 more seconds on that one, and then we will jump straight into the QA. Um, there's some really, really good points coming in the chat as well. I will need to read this after the um, webinar. Can't quite look at seven screens at once, uh, but it's really, really useful and appreciated. I know everyone else on the call is looking at the chat too. So, uh, five more seconds. And then we will move on to the uh, Q&A function. Let's go to panel mode, I believe. Excellent. Um, so for those of you uh, who don't know, we've also got Ben Godfrey on the tool. I mentioned earlier, he is Ollie's colleague at WPD. Um, and we'll be able to answer, support Ollie in answering some of those um, questions from a network perspective. So um, I'm going to fire over the first question to Grace. Uh, we had a question in the chat, which is, 
on your views on the role of hydrogen to potentially replace natural gas. Uh, I think especially in the context of peaking plants, but possibly even bigger scale, um, as a uh, flexible, storable, dispatchable uh, form of uh, electricity. Thanks, John T, for the question there. Um, yes, it is definitely something we are considering. It's also a um, part of our analysis. There is a whole section on hydrogen fuel generation, which we'll be looking at this year. Um, and it is considered as an option for um, existing gas and diesel kind of flexibility sites that they transition to another technology. Um, so this could be that they transition to hydrogen, or we could even see um, hydrogen like um, specific plants built in the future that are dedicated to hydrogen uh, peaking. Um, it definitely could happen in areas where hydrogen is readily available already. Um, so for example, um, looking quite far out now, maybe into the 2040s, if there are areas um, of the gas network that have been converted to hydrogen, it could make sense in those areas where there's an existing supply um, and it would be you would be able to kind of reuse um, the and repurpose the existing gas infrastructure um, for hydrogen peaking. Um, but it does depend um, on a number of locational factors. So the availability of low cost hydrogen um, and that obviously is dependent on the availability of low cost electricity um, in the first point. Um, that is very locational specific, so um, links quite well with our analysis being on a regional level and looking at these regional differences. Um, it definitely could have a role, um, although it is unsure, I suppose, at the moment. It's a fairly tricky kind of business model to prove, um, and I don't really think it's been uh, trialled at scale yet. So it is an option, but um, we haven't, you know, we haven't got any pipeline sites for it at the moment kind of thing. So it would definitely be looking out more towards the 2040s. Yeah, uh, Grace, I think that's a really important uh, point to, to push out. Like a, a lot of the local authorities that we've been um, talking to are very ambitious um, plans for decarbonisation and really want to start um, heading towards that at quite a rapid pace. Um, uh, so uh, we're very much um, keen to help those um, local authorities and those areas um, uh, expedite their decarbonisation pathway. And I think the most mature um, technology for that is electrification. Um, so uh, we're really keen, um, particularly to start pushing out uh, and working with local authorities to, to, um, to see what we can do in terms of energy efficiency, because I think that's one of the uh, least regret options. And then whether it's uh, uh, electric, hydrogen or some sort of blend uh, of fuels, um, once you've uh, embodied that energy efficiency in there, at least you're um, using all the, uh, the energy um, in, in the right places um, as, uh, as low as possible and not being wasteful. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Ben. I think we have to remember that the reason hydrogen is being talked about is that shift from an 80% reduction in emissions to 100% reduction. That's when it started to come into the picture. So it, it is only what well, is only intended to be for those that final 20% for some of those emissions that are really difficult to decarbonise. And as you say, in the near term, um, from you and from other organisations, the support should be for electrification. Um, in terms of our DFES analysis, as we've mentioned all the way through this, it is scenario based. So we are not providing WPD with one scenario of what they should do in the future or what re we as Regen think is likely, um, but a range of different scenarios that have different assumptions behind them. Um, so I, I know I answered a point in the chat around hydrogen heating, and it might be that one scenario has hydrogen for um, a large percentage of its heating and therefore we look at what that would mean for the network um, and there might be another scenario that actually favours electrification and has hydrogen only a very small proportion of buildings or maybe even none. Um, so hopefully you'll see that range of um, future projections kind of in our analysis. I don't think that's that's the really important thing about the work that we're doing here is to make sure that we've got a range of scenarios, because I think the one thing that we can all be sure of is, is there's not going to be one particular vector that solves everything. It's about creating that blend. Uh, and I think the work that we've got to do over the next um, uh, decade or so is to really um, uh, test out at scale about how all these different technologies can fit together, where the, the best use cases are for hydrogen and getting converting at the heart to um, decarbonise industries that are power intensive um, uh, uh, and then look at how that blend of technologies will work uh, uh, with the lowest cost, uh, well, with the uh, most uh, highest um, uh, decarbonisation uh, and minimal 
cost impact uh, to, to the energy consumers. Brilliant. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Ben. That's a really, really good and detailed answer. I've got a question now. Uh, I think we've had a few comments and questions in the chat generally around a similar theme uh, of how battery storage is considered uh, from a network perspective, so the benefits it can bring and um, sort of how it's accounted for in network costs. Um, I don't know, Ollie, if you had a sort of a quick rundown of sort of how, how you see battery storage in terms of network management. Yeah, so I can give a give a, a quick answer. I think Ben may be able to uh, to elaborate on it, given some of the work he's done in the past. But uh, yeah, from a battery storage perspective, um, our our interest as a DNO is making sure that it that it will operate um, that it can operate in a way to benefit the operation of the distribution network, but also making sure that it's designed in such a way that it um, would not cause any more issues or constraints on the network than in than there is currently due to, let's say, for example, importing at times of high demand, existing demand on the network or exporting at times of high generation. So as a DNO, we need to design the connection in such a way that we're sure that it's um, technically uh, safe, I suppose, from a network design perspective. But uh, we have done some work recently, and I, yeah, I'll leave Ben to elaborate on this because he was he was responsible for the for the project. But uh, some work we did with National Grid ESO uh, on a case study in our West Midlands area about um, battery storage, one of our regional development programs, which looked at this in a in a bit more depth and kind of identified some technical and commercial ways of accommodating battery storage better in such a way that it could um, kind of be technically um, compliant and then also operate in such a way that's more kind of commercially beneficial to the operation of the electricity network. Got anything to add to that, Ben? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ollie. Um, so the, the regional development programme that we've been working with, uh, National Grid ESO, um, over the past couple of years was looking specifically in the, in the West Midlands area. There's quite a lot of um, applications uh, across all four licence areas. Um, uh, the, the study outcomes were basically that um, uh, clearly, it doesn't make sense to uh, invest uh, in uh, lots of um, uh, additional infrastructure to accommodate energy storage um, uh, because the times of peak when, when perhaps the, the conditions might line up that will require all that additional infrastructure um, uh, can be most uh, economically uh, guided uh, by the use of uh, other commercial levers. Uh, so making sure that the energy storage are doing things that are, are running in conjunction and um, uh, in, in a kind of synchronous behaviour with, with what the constraints are and acting in the equal and opposite direction. I think that really is the, uh, is the aim of the work that we're doing uh, in conjunction with the ESO is to provide the right commercial signals to energy storage so that we can uh, ensure um, that the, um, there's the right uh, incentive on the energy storage and operating in the, in the right way. Um, the work that we found is that um, the national kind of wholesale markets and the um, balancing services that typically drive um, the operation of um, energy storage um, uh, are quite often um, uh, uh, in the same direction as what the, 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 the local, or sorry, in the opposite direction of what the local constraints are. So there's not really a huge amount of conflict and, and things um, uh, work. However, there are particular times when um, if a network is uh, running at its upper end, then um, a call from a national market may be at odds with um, what's happening at the, in the local area. Um, so we're working together with the ESO to make sure that we've got uh, transparent data flows between us and, um, uh, and their con uh, control centres, and particularly on their procurement um, side of things to make sure that um, when the uh, ESO is dispatching particular services, they're making sure that they're doing so in, in um, accordance with what the local networks can, can accommodate. Uh, so we very much see energy storage as being a, um, a valuable um, a, a additional alternative to conventional reinforcement. And if we use it in the right way and provide the right financial levers, um, then we can accommodate all the energy storage that we need. And that will help um, sort of deliver that uh, smarter and more flexible energy system that we require. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ali. Great answer. Um, I've got a couple uh, on some technologies that I'm involved in, so I'll, I'll try and answer these uh, quickly. Um, we've got a question about um, whether new build housing will be designed to avoid the need for space heating. Um, so I believe that the sort of the previous the zero carbon homes, 
that were proposed at the start of last decade uh, would have sort of built to those much higher, almost passive house standards, which would have minimised the need for space heating. As I understand it, the future home standard will not be that stringent, so it probably will require um, space heating and, and obviously water heating as well, but a, a reasonable amount of space heating. Um, we would ex probably expect um, conditions to get you know better and better as we go out into the 30s and 40s for new build homes. Uh, but right now, we would still expect them to need a reasonable amount of space heating. Um, Dave's picked up on our map that um, the heat pump results don't square too well with housing stock condition. Um, yes, I think um, if you look at it on a really granular level of who's putting a heat pump, they they do um, align with um, better condition housing stock and better insulated housing stock. Um, but at, when we're when we're talking about you know a few percent uptake even in, in the greatest areas, um, it's so very specific. You know, you could have a hundred houses in an electricity supply area. And only five of them need to be in really good condition and well insulated to have a heat pump in the near term. Um, moving forward, we do weight a lot of our um, heat pump uptake towards the better condition houses in the near term. And then we um, model the rollout of energy efficiency hand in hand with um, heat pumps to make sure that we are not, you know, projecting heat pumps to be installed and put into uh, poorer condition houses. Um, a lot of interest as well, I saw in the chat and the Q&A about uh, the large scale solar pipeline. It is um, really impressive in the East Midlands. Um, in terms of what's driving those um, proposals, um, I believe um, a lot of it is just down to uh, the continually reducing costs of solar PV modules um, and increasing efficiencies, you know, bifacial modules and our standards, squeezing out those extra few percent efficiencies from every module. And what's that done? What that's done has sort of opened up the subsidy free business model over the last couple of years. We have seen some sites actually commission and develop subsidy free. And I think a lot of developers are banking on that going forward and they're continually reducing costs. There are some um, other aspects like uh, cost of batteries falling, opening up that option for co location. Uh, I think we, we do see quite a few capture agreements now for batteries and solar. Um, and also um, some of the market conditions changing, such as the targeted charging review, which um, I don't think there's been a decision yet. There's a, maybe a minded two decision that may um, potentially impact the uh, connection costs for new solar PV. Um, I don't know if Ollie or Ben, you had any uh, thoughts on, on what's driving in your discussion with developments, what's driving the solar PV pipeline? Yeah, I would just, just add on that, John, to the um, uh, minor two position on the uh, uh, connection uh, network access and forward looking charges was published yesterday. Um, so um, that is um, uh, looking uh, as a minor two position to uh, reducing um, the amount of contributions that generation would need to make in order to connect onto the network and, and removing all contributions from demand customers. Uh, so we see that as a really positive step and, you know, uh, hopefully uh, customers um, uh, do as well. So I uh, definitely recommend um, uh, uh, everyone to have a look at that and um, respond to the consultation um, uh, to, to um, you know, to, to, uh, as that will hopefully drive some of these decarbonisation projects to uh, be a little bit more cost beneficial. Um, uh, and, and we can, as networks, we can start um, uh, in investing to, uh, to be able to accommodate all of uh, that growth that we, we can see. Um, I, I did see that there was a couple of questions uh, within the chat on, um, you know, assuring that there's sufficient capacity and, um, uh, you know, people being concerned that there is such large growth that um, uh, they might not be able to get the capacity that they want. Um, I think from, from our point of view, whether it's a solar connection or a heat pump or an electric vehicle, um, our whole sort of reason detra is to make sure that people can get can get access to the right electricity um, capacity that they need in their in their region, and that's something that we've really taken to heart. Um, the uh, DFES process that we've been doing over the past few years has really drawn strong focus on the amount of growth and how regionally allocated that that is as well. So we need to make sure that our business plans um, really reflect the needs of of what's um, happening on the ground at a local level. Um, you know, with that in mind, um, uh, we published our ED2 business plan today um, and we're setting forward um, uh, uh, two and a half times more load related expenditure than what we did in, in the, um, uh, the current ED1 period. Uh, so uh, a massive ramp up, which we think is really required to um, help 
um, everybody uh, achieve their decarbonisation aims. That you know, we all think that that's really important, and I think this is a, a really good catalyst. So, again, uh, if you're keen on uh, on on helping and uh, informing the consultation, then please go on my website, have a look at our business plan, and um, provide some commentary. Brilliant, thanks, Ben. I recognise we're a few minutes over, so I'll just try and get to this last question really quickly. Um, the pipeline of solar projects, um, what proportion of them actually sort of emerge and graduate to connections? Um, I can say from our end, um, we do a lot of benchmarking analysis of previous um, solar projects all the way using previous planning history, uh, connection history and that kind of thing to sort of get a uh, range of um, how many sites actually graduate because as, as you know, not all of them will actually be built out. Um, and the, the four scenarios allows us to produce an envelope. So we're not producing a single forecast for how that pipeline will be developed, but we do have, um, we will try and have a realistic range based on historic data, but also talking specifically to uh, some of the major players in solar development uh, going forward. Uh, very quickly, Ollie or Ben, I don't, I don't know if you have a, a figure <laughs> off the top of your head, it's probably putting you on the spot for how many of those connections agreements actually um, end up being full connections. I mean, certainly we see quite a lot of churn in terms of um, uh, generation uh, connections and offers. So um, uh, typically from, from our side, um, because there's various different uh, options, you know, different sizes of capacity that are looked in particular areas and perhaps more than one um, uh, connection provider seeking a quote in a particular area. But we tend to offer about 10 times as many uh, connection offers out uh, as are accepted um, and um, uh, sort of um, a fewer of those go forward to actually being built and energized onto the network so th there is quite a lot of um, churn on people um, uh, finding the right areas and capacity and, and making those projects work which I think is, is why we're really keen on perhaps networks taking on a bit more of the, the burden on, on some of the costs taking on a bit more of the risk on, on some of those uh, reinforcement um, uh, in, investment and, um, uh, and really uh, helping reduce the timescales to connect. Brilliant, thanks Ben. It's also worth noting that um, while um, that specific project might not be developed, um, pipeline sites where developers have already identified that area and chosen it as where they would like to potentially develop is our best possible evidence for where solar PV might be deployed in the future. So that specific project might not go ahead, but it's likely that area will be targeted in the future if we are developing in a scenario, gigawatts of, of solar PV onto the distribution network. Um, I think I don't want to keep any you any longer. Thank you so much, everyone. Any questions we didn't get to, we will get around to in the follow-up document. But thank you, Grace, Ollie, and Ben uh, for speaking and answering the questions. I think that was incredibly useful. And thank you everyone for your comments in the chat and your answers from Menti. It's absolutely incredibly valuable for our analysis, making sure the East Midlands is reflected uh, on these DFEZ projects. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Perfect. Thanks, Genty.